this is Zoo with Flipping the Switch, and today we're going to talk a little bit about Kirby and the Forgotten Land. But before we get into it, I want to talk a little bit about my thought process and what I was kind of thinking on a little bit of an intellectual level before we even get into the game itself. So bear with me here. Now, to me, we all know what it's like to be in a liminal space, even if we don't often think about them. Now, what is a liminal space? Well, both comforting and unsettling in equal measure, they are the state of in-between where we were and where we will be. Not quite past, but not entirely future either. And they're all around us. An entire video genre of online videos involves exploring vacant malls and empty construction sites, ghost towns and empty houses all over the world. Their abandonment remaining a mystery. Sometimes it's due to scarcity or disaster, but according to archaeologist David Wingrow, many of these places can also be explained by a new theory of seasonal civilization. Observing hunter-gatherers in the distant past, what he theorizes is that they would often go off into egalitarian bands during the good months and then all gather together in larger and more hierarchical arrangements to survive harsher times such as winter. Now, if borne out, this would mean that many of the ruins we find are the liminal spaces in between migrations for these tribes. Now, it makes a lot of sense, as prior um, agricultural developments there were little reason to interrupt the hunter-gatherer methods outside of scarcity exerting that pressure. And it would explain a lot of the things that don't add up as many of these sites lack evidence of permanent habitation despite decades of study. So what the hell does this have to do with Kirby and the Forgotten Land? Well, to me, Kirby and the Forgotten Land is seasonal civilization in game form, both thematically and in practice. Now, before you think that's a stretch, that comforting liminal space that feels familiar and hits all the beats it needs to with Kirby's more varied past, yet it still has an air of mystery and strangeness to it as we move into a 3D world. It feels like the Kirby game that you played before, less inventive than some of his more unique spinoffs, but it's just different enough to keep you curious and on your toes. And in choosing to set itself in this ruined and wonderful world betwixt, it might just be what we needed from the pink puff ball at this time in this place. Now, I've always been a Kirby player. One of the first games I ever finished for Game Boy was Kirby's Dream Land, and its sequel was one of my favorite games for the system. I later let a friend borrow that one, and he moved away, and I never saw it again, which I'll always regret. My favorite of these early Kirby games was always Dream Land 3 on the Super Nintendo though, as I've always preferred its coherency and its art style over the more popular Kirby Superstar, and it reminded me of one of my favorite VHS tapes, Little Nemo. Years passed, and the next game I played was Kirby's Epic Yarn on the Wii, which I enjoyed, yet I don't really consider that to be a real Kirby game, as it was originally to be a new IP, and it plays very different. And this was my last experience with Kirby until the Switch. Now, there's another reason behind my familiarity with the franchise that allowed this game to instantly register on my consciousness. There's always been a forgotten land in my own backyard here where I live in my hometown. A few blocks from where I live lies the Pillsbury plant, a massive complex that occupies 18 acres of land in the north end of the city I grew up in. By the time I was a child, the plant had already been long closed, and being a few blocks from where I attended elementary school, elementary school is still there by the way, it was the subject to the rumors and curiosity that comes part and parcel with Playground Chatter. We talked about how it was haunted, or that there was some kind of a gang occupying it, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle style, because it was all the rage back then. But these turned out to be the imaginings of children. With my purchase of the Switch and my drive for games having returned, I finally had an opportunity to catch up with the series. So I purchased Kirby Star Allies when it came out, ultimately dissatisfied with it as the balance of the gameplay was disrupted by the four-player emphasis, making it all too easy and boring to me since I tend to play these games solo. I sold it back to GameStop and forgot about Kirby again until the September 2001 Direct, where Forgotten Land was unveiled. The idea of Kirby brawling through the abandoned world called to me, and I patiently waited for the release and immediately paid the $60 entry fee. And now, it's finally time to book my star to this land of the lost. Now we open on a shot of Kirby enjoying a nice ride on his star when a dark cloud forms in the distance. It begins sucking up the residents of Popstar, including Kirby, who, awakening later on a strange beach, discovers that this is going to be a bit different than the usual adventures in Dreamland. Forgotten Land is full of abandoned malls, theme parks, industrial areas, 
and downtown squares that have been vacated by the people who originally built it. On top of that, the Beast Pack, sentient animals who have thrived with the absence of the Forgotten Land's original inhabitants, are roaming around kidnapping anyone they find for some unknown purpose. Now, the premise sets up several mysteries that Kirby will solve over the course of his journey. Where is he, and why was he transported here? Where did the original inhabitants go, and why did they leave in the first place? And why are the Waddle Dees being abducted by the Beast Pack? The game does a great job of answering all of these questions through environmental storytelling, with very little exposition outside of a couple of major milestones in the quest. Now, this will allow those paying attention to suss out some of the mystery early, though the final revelation should still provide a few surprises that I won't spoil here. Being trapped in this place until you can find a way home means that you'll need a safe place for those rescued to hang out. Fortunately, the Waddle Dees are efficient little buildings, and as you rescue more of them, new additions to this Waddle Dee town will begin to materialize, allowing Kirby access to many games to earn money, a workshop to upgrade your abilities, and even a coliseum that allows you to test your battle prowess in a controlled environment. Now, this gives you an added incentive to locate and rescue as many Waddle Dees as possible, as it's always fun to see what the next new addition of your community will be. Fortunately, Kirby is as powerful and capable as he's always been. He can still absorb abilities like sword and ice to use on his foes, and throughout his journey, he'll find blueprints and rare stones hidden throughout the stages that can be used to upgrade these abilities to be stronger and more useful over time. In addition to these returning powers, the new and amusingly named Mouthful Mode, swear to God, makes its debut. In some instances, Kirby will come across larger objects that he can swallow whole, resulting in him becoming an absorbed object for a time. Now these can range from cars to traffic cones, and it was a joy finding new objects to experiment with. All of this cooperates beautifully within the gameplay. I've always considered Kirby personally to be a beat -em -up with a side of platforming, and that hasn't changed with the transition into 3D. Enemies are numerous to the point of being hard to avoid, meaning the emphasis on using your abilities to throttle and batter them remains the series standard. And while things like bombs, cars, and boomerangs can all be used to this end, there are also the key to exploring the stages and finding waddledees to rescue as well as blueprints to upgrade your stats. Kirby has always been a slower and more methodical experience, and as a result, the transition into 3D was made with grace and with purpose. Now, from dark fun houses to old oil rigs, the industrial design mixed in with the beautiful natural landscapes, slowly overtaking them as a creative triumph of stage design. You will want to explore all of these levels thoroughly just to see how it uses its various themes in clever ways. Boss battles are the best in the series and showcase Kirby's upgraded movement potential in 3D. They feel fluid and engaging, and aside from that tree, you're always guaranteed to beat up every game. This is a Kirby game, after all. I won't be spoiling in any of them. All of this culminates in a bonkers final fight and ending sequence that sets up an additional post-game fun. Now, graphically, the game shines bright, giving us vibrant colors and creative uses of its various worlds and themes. While I would normally be the first to cry foul on a standard grass, water, ice world motif, here it has significantly elevated by the industrial elements interspersed throughout, as well as some interesting concepts like Badlands and an amusement park area. There's also a wide variety of enemies with an astounding attention to detail surrounding their animations and expressions, and the Awoofies are now one of my favorite things ever in a game. It was a lot of joy to experience it on my OLED. It looked absolutely gorgeous. Kirby's games have also had some of the most under-acknowledged musical greatness in gaming, in my opinion. And this soundtrack continues the trend of varied and wonderful soundtracks. The main theme of the game and its variations is an earworm that will never leave you. And the entire soundtrack is a synthesis of rock and orchestra that left me wowed on numerous occasions. The production values are definitely here. Favorite tracks include Faded Dreams of Psycho Meddler and Northeast Frost Street, so check those out. In the sound effect department, everything sounded distinctively Kirby with the classic sound effects and accompanying new efforts for the various mouthfuls. Solid effort all around in the sound department. Now, from a technical perspective, the game runs smooth as silk. Load times are fine, and I had no trouble with slowdown, bugs, or glitches. Now, that doesn't mean that there were no missteps, however. Now, most worlds contain a paltry four stages of mainline content, which seems short for what was on offer. Post-game content aside. Enemies also go down way too easy considering how powerful you will become, and could have used either more health or more enemies to account for this. 
The game has a two-player mode with Bandana D being used by the second player, but given the fragility of most enemies, there was no way I was going to play that way. My lesson learned from Star Allies. Price-wise, it's a Nintendo game, meaning that it will probably forever be locked at that full price, barring the sales, so always be on the lookout for those. Now, as I close out my experience in the Forgotten Land, I can't help but dwell on the concept of liminal spaces that many of the game's environments perfectly encapsulate. 3D Kirby feels just different enough to elicit some discomfort, but is still recognizable enough to be comforting. It contains the echoes of what came before, but it is clear as I walk through these stages that those echoes no longer fully represent what Kirby has become. A seasonal civilization has been constructed for Kirby, like the Pillsbury plant I mentioned earlier, which is currently undergoing a transformation of its own. A citizen's effort is slowly cleaning up and transforming it into a park and historical site. Repurposed to be utilized by a new generation for what they deem fit while maintaining and respecting the vestiges of what came before. For Kirby, a versatile franchise that has been through more of a journey than any other Nintendo IP damn near, a hunter-gatherer if you will, I think it's actually a fitting metaphor that he's finally put down seasonal roots in 3 d Future games may continue to be experimental, like past games were, but after experiencing this effort, I can't help but feel that when it's time to get serious, that this is what he should call. Hey, for those who stuck around, I just want to thank you all for continuing to listen, and just wanted to greatly appreciate everything. I love all of you. Appreciate everything you've done here. I am going to be continuing to make content like this and start to get some video rolling. I actually learned editing, if you can even believe that. (laughs) But it's going well, and I have to say I enjoy it. So, once again, just wanted to thank everybody. If you want to do the YouTube thing, you can. If not, that's okay, too. Thanks for listening this far. This has been Zoo with Flipping the Switch, and just wanted to tell you again, thank you so much, and looking forward to what comes next, working on some new reviews. Uh, If you do know any beat-em-ups or any platform games, 3D or otherwise, that you think I'd enjoy, you can always leave them in the comments for me. I might, I probably have them, but in general, I'm always looking for new games that I might have missed with the Switch, so definitely a place to do that, but take care, guys. I hope to see you next time, and I hope you continue to game on.